Well, Betty Sinclair was the, it's the 30th, 30th anniversary of her death, and Betty Sinclair was uh, one of the founding members of the civil rights movement back in the 1960s. She was a secretary of the Belfast Trades Council for decades. Um, she was a lifelong member of the Communist Party of Ireland, and, and we just thought it was right to honour her memory. There is power in the factory. Weekend, set up probably in, in twofold. The looking at um, alternative economic sort of strategies involving trade unionists, community workers, people from cooperative organisations, and uh, and uh, also the whole concept of here. How will that affect sectarianism? How will sectarianism will it thrive? Or how then do we start uh, combating sectarianism the way we've done in the past? Well, I think I've been usually excited and uh, buoyed up by the convivial, constructive and uh, very enjoyable uh, experience we've had here these past few days. I mean, we're facing some major issues. I do detect there's a, a, a creative willingness now to try new ideas, certainly amongst broad left progressives, which I've certainly found in the last uh, few days. So I leave here usually more hopeful in terms of the capacity of progressive forces on the island of Ireland to actually rise up to the challenge. It ain't going to be easy. It's clear to anyone that um, there needs to be an alternative economics, um, and not just here in the north of Ireland, but across Ireland, across these islands, and indeed across Europe. Um, it's quite clear that local assembly, local government, that the executive is sort of stuck in a neoliberal rut. They don't know what else to do. They're kind of stuck with orthodox neoliberal thinking. And um, the same goes for the southern government, the British government, and across Europe, you've seen it. So it's about time that the left, or, or any progressive elements within society, come together and start suggesting alternative ways to provide the goods and services that we need as a society. There's a shared analysis beginning to emerge, and is around things like challenging inequality, and replacing our discourse of poverty with one that's about inequality, uh, introducing things around the green issues in terms of a low-carbon, renewable energy economy that the era of growth is now over, so a post-growth vision, one in which I think uh, human flourishing and quality of life uh, is central. But I do think that there is a, a seriousness of the current moment, unprecedented opportunities, and I think we've begun something quite important here this weekend. Let's hopefully see the conversations continuing. And I think there's a lot of energy and passion here this weekend for looking at things again, looking at theories that maybe we had left behind and ideas that we'd left behind. And there's, a, there's great energy here this weekend. I'm learning a lot. I'm looking forward to the next speech. In times of crisis, a trade union movement tends to kind of fall back on wages and, and the work conditions. Uh, that's this kind of stopgap. You know, kind of, that's where it, you know, it kind of falls back on. So it's great you know, actually having a weekend that, that hasn't lost sight of the wider kind of viewpoint. You know? Well, I mean, we, we, we're a part of the Labour movement. We see ourselves firmly rooted in the Labour movement. It's the largest democratic working class movement on the planet. We're the world's biggest social movement, and we feel out that we're connected to that social movement. There's 200 million trade union members worldwide, maybe 250 million worldwide, and we see ourselves as part of that social movement. But we do feel and we do understand the criticisms. Over the last 30 years, particularly, the trade union movement has become so bureaucratised in parts that it's forgotten what it's about. And we do see our role in part as trying to bring political education at least back into the trade union movement. That sounds a bit grand now, but just trying to um, kind of energise people in the union movement with a bit of political economy and a bit of economics and a bit of political theory. It's not enough to do health and safety training. It's not enough to do courses on identity politics. You have to bring economics and political economy back into the trade union movement. And this school is partly about trying to do that. Far too often we're left with uh, discussions with employers about redundancies, for example, and dealing with the, the fallout from the government policies and decisions and the market. And, um, and that's, we, need, we need activists who understand how that comes about and we need to start talking about how we can stop redundancies happening in the first place rather than just dealing with the aftermath. I think it's been really, really important um, few days, hasn't it, because it's brought together a wide range of political views and perspectives across the community, the Republican lawyers community, which is unusual today, and a good good atmosphere, a nice ambience, a lot of discussion. Well, I thought the weekend created a number of opportunities, themes around, for example, cooperative development uh, that would be practically relevant in terms of the current economic climate and certainly for local communities in particular. It's been an extraordinary weekend in many ways in terms of the diverse elements of the left 
coming together, you know, and challenging each other's perspectives. There's been a wonderful sense, I suppose, of a shared purpose, despite all our different backgrounds and beliefs, and challenging, but very rewarding nonetheless. The Union forever defending your rights Down with the black legs, all workers unite With our brothers and our sisters many far off lands There is power in a union